Hey folks, Dr. G here. So uh, in my video for the quantum particle in a box, the one dimensional particle in a box, I felt that I, I wish I would have spent a little more time talking about normalization and orthonormal basis sets and also linear combinations of the solutions to the Schrodinger equation being solutions uh, themselves. So that's what this uh, lesson is all about. So note uh, what I've written here, right? So importantly, all solutions to the Schrodinger equation form an orthonormal basis set. We're gonna get into what that means. And also, any linear combination of these wave functions that are solutions to the Schrodinger equation are also solutions uh, to the Schrodinger equation, right? So you can make linear combinations of these wave functions that basically have that form below, and then the only thing you can change is that little n, right? You can set that to any, in, any integer, any positive integer. One is the smallest you can do, right? And so basically, you can, you can add up linear combinations of these and also make wave functions out of them. So let's first talk about the orthonormal uh, basis set. What do I mean by that? Well, if you multiply a wave function by its complex conjugate, right? That's what I have on, in the integral here. And you integrate that over all space. That integral is going to be zero if little n is not equal to little m here. Um, and so notice, so what's little n, what's little m? That's, that's just an indicator to say what we've set that uh, quantum number to. Um, so n is the value, is the letter we've been using, and then m just, you know, uh, you know it's next to n in the alphabet, so I went with that. Um, and so basically, uh, if you set that, that to the same value, you're going to get 1, and if you set them to different values, you're going to get 0. So that, that's what we mean by this. And, you know, this is a little bit similar to Cartesian unit vectors, right? So that's, that's, a, that's a basis too, right? So, you know, basically our, our Cartesian unit vectors, if you look at them, each one is unit length 1, and if you take the dot product of any pair of those, you're going to get 0, Right, so if you dot x hat with y hat, that's a zero, right? There's, there's the dot product is zero for that. But if you dot x hat with itself, you get one. So you see how this is sort of a, a similar uh, principle here. So let's, let's work through it a little bit. So let's take an example. Let's say that we set n equal to one and m equal two. So what we're doing is we're saying, uh, all right, these are two legal solutions to the one dimensional particle in a box. And, uh, you know, for the for psi 1, we've set the quantum number 1, and for psi 2, we're using the quantum number 2. Uh, so if we do that, you get the uh, integral you see there on the right. And if we were to plot this, it looks like that. And so, like, yes, we could uh, uh, do this integral. Uh, in fact, later we're going to use uh, some software to do the integral for us. Um, but just plotting it, I want you to kind of appreciate for a moment that uh, notice how going from 0 to L, of these, these two wave functions multiplied together, do you see how the area above the curve kind of matches the area above the below the curve? So, and that's exactly, exactly what happens, right? All the area that's above the curve uh, is canceled out by the area below the curve. Um, so yeah, so this integral ends up being zero because we have two different values for uh, the quantum number. And uh, you know, now let's test this out using the Mathematica software. All right, so here I have prepared for you a demonstration of the one-dimensional quantum particle in a box using Mathematica. And here we have our wave function, right? This is our normalized wave function. Uh, this is a box of length four from zero to four. So the normalization constant, we have the square root of two over four because okay, the box is length four. And here's our quantum number, right? We have one and one. So as I said for the orthonormal basis set, if these numbers match, it'll integrate to one. So if I run this, yeah, that's one. But now, so this is both in the ground state, and that's what we have down here. So let's plot it. So here's the probability density function here, right? So this is uh, this is this is in area one of that integral here. If you were to integrate that, and right, because that's what we're doing here. That's how we know it's one, right? <laughs> we also knew it from before. But so if I change this to two, so let's say uh, we have the ground state one, and then we also use the quantum number for the first excited state, which is two here. If I integrate that. Look at that, we get zero. Uh, and that, right, this is orthonormal. So if I put two here, we integrate that, and look at that thing, right? look at that probability density function. You can eyeball this, and it is pretty clear to see that the amount of area you have above the curve is canceled out by the area below the curve. So let's try another one. Let's go with uh, two and two, right? So that's gonna go back to one. 
that's going to go back to a positive value. This is one also, right? So this is one. Uh, and, and of course, you see that all of the area is above the curve. So let's try, uh, let's try one and three. Let's see what that does. So the area is zero, of course, and one and three. And there we go. This one's maybe a little harder to eyeball and, and, and see it, but it's, it's not too hard to believe that if you add up the area of these two bumps above the axis and then the area below it here, that that's going to cancel out and be zero. And sure enough, that is what happens. Uh, this is just we're trying to build visual intuition for it. And just for the sake of completeness, let's let's look at what happens if we use the same wave function, right? So, uh, you know, quantum number one for both of them. So that's what we see this integral here. Well, we recognize this. This is just the normalization condition. We already knew that that was going to give us uh, one, because remember, we normalized that wave function. That square root of two over L, we had to figure that out, that that's the normalization constant. So we knew what this was going to be anyway. Uh, so the really, the one we had to demonstrate fresh was the one showing that uh, the orthogonality here, that basically, um, if there's different quantum numbers, that integral is going to work out to zero. All right, so now let's talk about superposition states. What is this? So basically, this is saying linear combinations of the allowed solutions. So these are all individually solutions to the Schrodinger equation, right? You can have, you, for that little n there, you can put any integer value you want, one all the way up to whatever number you like. And that's going to be a legal solution. But it turns out you can also take multiple wave functions like this and combine them as a linear combination. Um, so that's what we see here now with the, the psi of alpha psi 1 plus beta psi 2. That's what we're seeing here. Okay, so what are these values alpha and beta? We know what psi 1 and psi 2 are. Those are two solutions to the Schrodinger equation, right? The ground state is 1 and the first excited state is 2. But how do we know what these numbers in front of them should be? Uh, like, is there any sort of constraint on that? Because can we set it to anything we want? Mm, probably not. So let's find out what the constraint is. So we're going to invoke the normalization constraint here. And so we know what this is, right? Psi star times psi, integrate that over all space, and you're going to get 1. Well, uh, what that actually looks like here, right, our, our wave function here is alpha psi 1 plus beta psi 2. So if we multiply that by itself, and again, both of those wave functions have no imaginary part, so we don't have to worry about uh, uh, flipping anything here. Um, and so if we have these two multiplied like that, do you remember from, you know, back in the day, you probably learned the FOIL method, right? First, outer, inner, last. That's all we're going to do here, right? So alpha times psi 1 times alpha psi times psi 1. Uh, that's the first, and then the outer will be alpha psi 1 times beta psi 2, right? That's outer. So you go first, outer, inner, last, and we're going to get this. And notice there's a cross term in the middle. So you've got, uh, you know, alpha psi 1 times uh, beta psi 2, but then later you do beta psi 2 times alpha psi 1, right? So you're going to have two of those. So we're going to add those together. Um, and so now we've, we've basically just done a FOIL method. That's all we've done so far. But now what we're going to do, we are going to split up our integrals here, right? Because integrals, you can always do this, right? The integral of a bunch of things added together, you can also integrate them separately and then add them. So we're going to take advantage of that. And so looking at this middle term here, this cross term, so I want you to think about that and think if there's some way we can get rid of that, thinking about orthonormal basis sets and notice that we're taking an integral with a psi two times a psi one, hmm, right? There's different uh, there's different quantum numbers there. So yeah, that's actually going to come out to zero, right? That two out the two alpha beta is going to come outside the integral, and we know that the, the integral is just zero. So that that actually goes away. So we can get rid of that one, and let's move our alpha squared and our beta squared outside as well. And uh, now those integrals, we know those as well. Again, we can invoke the normalization uh, constraint here. We know that uh, psi 1 times psi 1, integrate that over all space, that gives us a 1, right? And same thing with uh, psi 2. So those are going to be 1s. So you're going to have alpha, alpha squared plus beta squared equals 1. Well, that's the normalization constraint here for our coefficients. So basically, uh, the sum of these uh, coefficients squared has to add up to 1, no matter how many you have, right? The, the sum of uh, the coefficients squared has to add up to 1. And just to look at one particular example, um, you know, if we've got half, let's say that we want to prepare a state that is half ground state and half first excited state, then these are our coefficients. We put the square root of 0.5 
times uh, psi 1 plus the square root of 0 0.5 times psi 2. That is what our coefficients must be to get a half and half mixture. So if we're talking about superposition states, uh, I thought it would be good to return to the FET simulator, right? PHET, so phet.colorado.edu. Uh, that's where you can get uh, free access to this, thanks to the good folks uh, at the FET simulations. And uh, so here we have a, a quantum particle in a box. And here we have the probability density function, where I can show the wave function. Switch over to the wave function, show both the real and the imaginary part. And we see that they're changing in time. But uh, if you multiply uh, this wave function by its complex conjugate, then we get this probability density function here. And uh, notice that for this state that is only the ground state, it's not changing in time, right? We call this a stationary state. Um, but, and, and this works for any of these, any of these states that are, th these are all stationary states, right? This is the first excited state, the second excited state, the third excited state, right? For each, uh, level up, we gain a node in the uh, in the in the wave function, that, and then it leads to a node in probability. Right? You can never find the particle where the nodes are; it'll never be there. Um, and now, so let, let's go to the superposition state. So, if we go to a superposition state, now we can choose like we want to mix. We want to get a mix of different uh, um, quantum states here. So, let's say I want to do half. C1 and half C2, right? This is like psi1 and psi2 from how I was writing it, right? So let's say, uh, I'll just say like 1 and 1. And we'll set this one to 0, right? But then we click normalize. Well, notice that changed it to 0.71 and 0.71. And then I apply that. And now look, if I close this, notice how the probability density function is changing in time now. It's no longer stationary, right? So that's what's up with that, right? Because the wave function, you know, the wave functions, that, that's always moving, right? Whether it's a, um, a single quantum state, right? Like a, um, whether it's a stationary state that is only the ground state or the second excited state or whatever it may be, right? The wave function's always moving in time. But the probability density function, that moves for a superposition state, but it is stationary for a stationary state. Um, and notice how it went to uh, 0.7. I think it was 0.71, something like that, right? Let's look at it again. Yeah, 0.71. Well, 0.71 squared, you know, try that. It's going to come out pretty close to 0.5, right? Because this is half and half. So if we want a half and half mixture, you don't set the coefficients to 0.5 and 0.5. You set it to 0.71, right? Because if you square that, you get something close to, to 0.5, right? This is clearly this is clearly rounded, right? Um, so since we were talking about linear combinations of solutions to the Schrodinger equation, which are, we call them superposition states, I wanted to again kind of remind you what these things look like. And this is it.